This is the Balancing Act by Security Compass, your guide to going fast while staying safe in today's digital world. On today's episode of Leaders in Product Security, Rohit Sethi, CEO at Security Compass, is joined by John Deskarakis, Chief Product Security Officer at Carrier Global Corporation. John is responsible for vision, strategy, and direction for global product security. Carrier is a leading global provider of healthy, safe, and sustainable building and cold chain solutions. John's program supports hundreds of products and offerings, 56,000 employees and 80 plus brand business, including Lenel S2, Edwards, Kitty, Onity, Chubb, and many more. Well, John, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Uh, you have quite a unique background for a product security leader. Can you tell us how you got into the field? Yeah, sure. So um, I, I came up as a software engineer, uh, developing uh, code and product and sort of evolved into a system architect over time. Uh, and part some of my interests were always in cyber aspects, but because of the nature of uh, the places I was working for, for a season when I first started, I, I was in the commercial world uh, for a number, number of years. But uh, then uh, it some point I ended up working at a company called Raytheon and at Raytheon, uh, this is a defense contractor. We were building things like uh, secure communication systems and missile defense systems and things like this. So th there wasn't really uh, a sense or a mission of secure development per se. It was just a requirement of what we did. So I never really thought of what I was doing as secure development. These were just engineering requirements like any other, build a system that does this and is impervious to that, right? Uh, so over time, I, I was developing those skills uh, in trial by fire. And uh, then over time, I, I started to gain a lot of extra interest in the cyber aspects of the systems I was designing and building. And so really kind of focused some of my extracurricular education there. And then we started building uh, systemic programs and methodologies to uh, do these things across major global programs in my time over there. Uh, and then that evolved into me uh, leaving aerospace and going back into the commercial world and helping big manufacturers do the things that I was naturally doing for many years uh, in the aerospace world and on defense programs, uh, but in the commercial space where maybe it wasn't so much ingrained in that market in those verticals as long as it had been in the aerospace world. So that, that's really how I got started in it. That's where I you know, learned the skills to do these things. Uh, and, you know, so I basically grew up as a software engineer and evolved into a security professional from there. Yeah, that the idea of starting in software and moving into security has been a common theme. Although I think what's interesting in your world is the the, the bent on defense and aerospace. That's certainly uh, unique amongst our guests. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll tell you, and I, I talk to my team about this all the time. Uh, in my previous years in aerospace, although I I had worked on missile defense projects that were really complex and some really neat secure communication systems. Uh, fundamentally under the hood, the way those uh, systems and products uh, worked and functioned, if you didn't know what their endpoint function was to the end user, fundamentally under the hood, they, they kind of do the same thing. They, they store data and information and send it across systems and interconnect uh, no differently than uh, an access control system in a building might. Uh, there, there's really not that much difference if you're looking under the hood and you don't understand what the function of the system is. Uh, so the way that we secure our systems, whether it's in the commercial space or it's uh, in the aerospace world, isn't that different. Um, so that, that's the one lesson I try to bring my folks. Don't worry about the, the function of the device or the function of the system. The way we're going to go about securing it is, is going to be pretty much kind of the same sort of practices and activities. We're gonna be looking at the same things. The high level topology of what we are working on and what we're trying to build securely, the way we're gonna do that 
isn't that different from one system to the next. In fact, it's very similar. The things that change are what are the vertical, the verticals you're supporting? Are there different you know, pieces of legislation you have to think about? Are there, what are the, the functional requirements for mission success of your end user? That's kind of more of what you're thinking about. Um, so what the device does to me is usually irrelevant. The way we'll secure it is going to be systematic and similar. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, completely. I, I can completely uh, understand that. And I think it's a good segue. A lot of people might look at a company like Carrier and say, why would an HVAC company need a product security function or a chief product security officer? How would you respond to that? It's a good question. And uh, the first thing I would tell a person is uh, Carrier is no longer just an HVAC company. Uh, these days, we're a lot more. Um, Carrier, as well as many other uh, commercial entities and businesses spun off of UTC uh, a year ago and became a new company and that company is Carrier. Uh, and we have a lot of uh, global business brands in the space of commercial HVAC and residential HVAC, which is traditionally what Carrier is thought of to be. Uh, but we also have many, many businesses in the fire and security space and those verticals. Uh, we have businesses in refrigeration. Uh, so we build an array of products. Virtually any product you might find inside of a big, uh, con a big uh, commercial building is something that Carrier is manufacturing. I, I like to tell people all the things that make a building livable, that's what we build. So starting with the HVAC systems, uh, but also access control systems, uh, intrusion systems, fire detection and suppression systems, uh, refrigeration systems, like when you go to the supermarket and pull your meat out of a cooler, we build those coolers. We also build the means and mechanisms to get the, the produce and food from the farm to the grocer and to your table. So th there's a lot of things that we do that folks uh, not, aren't always aware of, but Carrier is a big entity. And things have even changed, even if we were just a HVAC uh, company. In the HVAC world, a lot of things have changed. The average HVAC system once upon a time was a, a simple mechanical unit uh, connected deducted systems, right? And kind of operating in a closed loop environment, pushing tempered air around a controlled space. But that's evolved from, from the old days of that, started to evolve into smart building technology. This became the thing to talk about three to five, seven years ago, everyone was trying to transition into smart building technology. And now a lot of manufacturers are doing a great job with that, including Carrier. Um, but that's even evolved to kind of more robust and resilient designs through uh, digital transformation. Uh, so the smart buildings have evolved a Carrier in, in another way into healthy building technology. And I joined Carrier uh, a little over a year ago. When I got here, there was a lot of talk of this, of course, with the global pandemic. And I thought, wow, this was really smart of us to position this way. But then I learned that Carrier had been building this sort of technology uh, for many years. Uh, the healthy building technology space uh, has been a primary uh, world that Carrier has been building products for and competing in going back uh, several years before the pandemic. So the company was really positioned to offer a lot of solutions in that space. But these sort of technologies, uh, even in just in the HVAC space, as I said, evolved in a way where there's a lot of connectivity, there's a lot of data flowing uh, from closed systems into the cloud. And now all of these products that were once just on a closed loop, just pushing air around a building, uh, these are very sophisticated, complicated devices that require uh, cybersecurity to be an element. Uh, so things have changed, but we also operate in a lot of other spaces. So that, that, that would be my answer. That's uh, fascinating and uh, really interesting when you think about it. One of the things you mentioned there was refrigeration. And um, during the pandemic, there's been a lot of awareness of things like cold storage. Talk to me about how product security plays a role in that. 
Yeah, so cold storage technology is uh, critical for an array of applications, uh, such as something I already mentioned, perishables like food. Uh, so if you just you know consider what has to happen in order for your local grocer to deliver a gallon of milk and keep it from spoiling from farm to the grocery store so that you can get it to your table, uh, there's a lot of technology involved to make that happen. Temperatures must remain constant and reliable. And when I say reliable, that means they've, they've got to get monitored somehow. So if you're transporting these things across an entire continent or from one state, from one side of your state to the next, monitoring all of those temperatures in real time requires a lot of technology. And I would tell you a lot of cybersecurity capabilities. Now let's shift that idea if we're just talking about the gallon of milk into solving the sorts of problems we encountered during this pandemic, specifically vaccines. And one of the things many of us learned around the world this last year was that the vaccines people need to fight the pandemic not only must be kept at cold temperatures, but we're talking about Antarctic style temperatures, right? So ranges of zero degrees Fahrenheit down to minus 100 F. And so what we're talking about is if you're in Celsius, roughly negative 70 degrees Celsius, right? Imagine having to keep vaccines at these constant temperatures when they are manufactured, they're not always manufactured in your state or nearby, and they may even need to be shipped across an ocean. Now, how do you monitor and maintain those temperatures when they're being shipped at great distances and across an ocean? And then the redundancy systems that are required to keep those temperatures constant. What if a machine that's keeping these things cold breaks down? And how do you keep something at that constant negative 70 C temperature when a shipping container, it may seem kind of easy where it's like this giant refrigeration system. Most companies don't have the technology to keep things that cold. Of course, we manufacture that sort of thing here. But then to get it out of that system and then into maybe something the size of a briefcase so you could walk it into a hospital, how do you do that? Um, and how do you keep things in monitoring and all that? So Carrier has been building this sort of technology for many years. And we refer to it as the secure cold chain. And so you'll, you'll hear that phrase uh, talked about a lot uh, by folks inside of this company. And all of this technology requires uh, a lot of coordination, a lot of communication of data and information going all across the planet, which of course, if you think about it, is a cybersecurity concern area. We have to not only be able to build all these technologies, but do it in a way that's safe and secure that ensures mission success. And in this case, it's a pretty big and important mission. So the, the secure cold chain is of the utmost importance, uh, not only a carrier, but all around the world. Yeah, the, that's an understatement. <laughs> it's, it's, it's absolutely, absolutely pivotal to, to the world right now. So um, can definitely appreciate how important it is. Um, if you were at another company that manufactured software-enabled physical devices, but didn't have the role of chief product security officer or its equivalent, how might you convince that company's executives to invest in the role and function? That's a good question. And this isn't exactly a far-fetched idea either. The, the CPS role is absolutely an emerging role. Um, and the statistics are there and easy to point to. Uh, when you're trying to convince uh, executives of the necessity of this role. Cyber breaches in software cost companies and jurisdictions many millions every year. And the scale and complexity and the very targets for attack are evolving and changing constantly. Uh, I mean, who would have thought a few years ago or even a few months ago that a pipeline would be a potential target of attack? And look at what that's costing us. So I can remember when I was a simple engineer who was considered a subject matter expert in these areas years ago. Um, often the debate was always about, 
well, this system isn't really kind of a target for an, for a hacker, so we're not going to so much worry about it. That was always the debate. <laughs> Yeah. where now it's starting to be uh, just a given that we should expect any system that's built or manufactured could become a target. I remember when in the manufacturing space, most large industrial control systems, like a chiller, for example, this is the, the giant machinery that is in the basement of a skyscraper that keeps the whole skyscraper cool. One of these systems costs like north of a million dollars. But once upon a time, it was thought that, hey, who's going to attack a chiller sitting in the basement. What, what do they care what temperature it is on floor 75? Well, you can imagine the amount of chaos it might cause uh, a, a building owner and all of the residents of the big skyscraper in Manhattan if in the middle of July, all of a sudden their, their building can't be cooled and they don't have windows that can be opened, right? So a lot of attacks are done uh, just to create chaos, but what we're starting to see is that cyber criminals are, are capitalists and they're looking to make money and they're holding things ransom like pipelines. Uh, so the role of a CPSO, it, especially in a manufacturing company that builds OT style BMS technologies like we do at Carrier, security assurance not too long ago was thought of like a value add to end users, something we may be able to throw on a spec sheet, but that's evolved to an expectation, right? When we're building these huge industrial control systems and somebody's spending a million dollars on it, uh, the buyers and the end users simply expect that the systems are secure. Um, but the simple fact of the matter is nothing is ever really 100% secure. And this is what the role of the CPSO enables. It's, it's why it's a required function for a responsible manufacturer. You know, attacks and attackers evolve. And if we're static in our controls and our measures for defense on the other side of the fence from the attackers, we'll, we'll inevitably fail miserably. You know, not only do we uh, CPSOs support this expectation in market spaces that we'll support and be proactive to things and do everything in our power to prevent failures and ensure mission success. But we have to also be ready to respond when attackers find new and creative ways around the controls we've put in place. You know, cybersecurity is an ever evolving discipline that requires vigilance, requires we're always tightening the screws and adjusting our defenses to ensure mission success for our users. You know, in a company like Carrier, uh, without, a, without having the role of the CPSO, um, you're removing the, the ability to be systemic about things and build mature capabilities that are capable of evolving. Um, if you just bring your security maturity and the things you're manufacturing to some certain level and call it a day, you're missing the boat. And, and not having security professionals in there to be able to respond to things in real time and evolve the, the work as needed. It's kind of like having a hospital without doctors and nurses. That, that's the most simplistic way I can put it. Uh, we can't script cybersecurity because things change too frequently, things evolve. And if we don't, if companies don't have someone on the other side of the fence to evolve with the attacks, it's like running that hospital without doctors and nurses. We're gonna to try to just follow a script of best practices and just hope we get it right. And inevitably we're gonna fail. It doesn't mean just because we have the doctors and nurses, we're not saying that it's always gonna be 100%, uh, but you're gonna be a, a heck of a lot more ready to ensure mission success and respond to things in triage as needed. And also um, build proactively and build secure designs and those kind of things that you don't really know from looking at a book because we're always trying to look at evolving our approach. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, let, let's pick on that a little bit, the last piece. The term shift left is used pretty commonly in industry to emphasize integrating security earlier in the software development process. And I've had this conversation with many people. I think that there are a lot of folks who take that to mean do static analysis earlier, find bugs through uh, 
spell checker or something along these lines uh, when, when you code. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, this, this is always a, a key topic. And what helps is to kind of understand where shift left even came from, right? So, I mean, once upon a time, most companies that develop software and embedded firmware, uh, the ones who worried about security of their products and cybersecurity uh, really focus heavily on testing, you know, which is a reactive approach. And what we're talking about is validation testing and penetration testing in the cyberspace. And these things are that were then and are now necessary, um, but it's only one layer of what's really required. Our, our thinking as cyber professionals evolved in long ago um, that we really understood that testing alone is imperfect. The test first pro approach evolves from kind of the QA focus of software engineering. You, you wanna build a widget, you get requirements, you build your widget, you put it into QA and make sure it's functioning in the way that you expect it to. So in the early days of, hey, we need to make sure that our widget cannot be attacked, the same sort of approach was applied because the same engine, there weren't the roles of CPSO and there weren't really dedicated cybersecurity professionals in the engineering phase. Cyber was kind of used to be more of an IT focus where it's evolved to something different. The product security professional, the, the secure developer is not the same thing as an IT cybersecurity person uh, or an enterprise cybersecurity person. We are looking at a different layer of things. Um, so the test first and test only idea what we started to learn was a lot of engineers would say, gee, it'd be, it would be nice to learn about these things we're finding out about in pen testing earlier because that is an expensive way of doing things, right? So if you spent a, a whole year building a widget only to find out at the very end when you're doing your pen testing widgets ready for market, uh, that you, you have a lot of flaws that you have to go back and fix. And maybe some of those flaws are buried underneath a lot of other layers of your architecture and you have to undo a lot of things, that's expensive. And that's on the right side of your development life cycle. So the idea of shift left started because people were saying, hey, let's, let's shift our viewpoint of the secure development aspects away from testing. We'll still do the testing at the end, but let's look at it early, right? So we shifted left in our industry. Um, we wanted to start considering solving the problems before we found out about them in testing. And testing also, by the way, is an imperfect approach. You're not always gonna find everything. So if you look at it from a deep system design level focus, um, you're gonna kind of root out most common flaws really early in your architecture. And then this is also what helps you design robust solutions that are not so difficult to to make changes to later. So if you really introduce the right security controls and you have robust designs in your architecture, it allows you to not only be more proactive and save costs in the beginning, but you could save costs later when you have to be reactive and you find other issues if you have a robust design. So this, the idea of all of this is introduce the controls early so that you're not just discovering everything and testing and this better ensures mission success for you, the developer and product owner, but also for your customers and end users. And then if things are found out there in, in the real world, as you send your product to market, hopefully your design allows you to make changes on the fly if you need to. Um, and this is the other thing that's really important where we've evolved again, but shift left enough. If you're doing everything you need to do in the early design phase, you're, you're identifying all the security requirements that you must have and you build the widget as perfectly as you can on Rev1, and you did all the testing possible and you send it out there and you feel really good about it, is that enough? And the answer we we all know is it's not, it's never enough. For one reason is what I talked about earlier, attacks and attackers and attack vectors evolve and shift. The things you think you have solved today, you'll find out later, it's, it's now a problem and you have to go back to the, to the design board and build in another control to, to stop some other thing you hadn't thought about before. So it's starting to become shift everywhere because 
you've got, you can't just build your widget and can think about it like I've done a perfect job, send it out there and our job is done. Whatever happens in the future, not our responsibility. I mean, technology requires nowadays that we shift everywhere because the products that we're building that once weren't connected to anything that were running in a closed loop, they're now hosted in the cloud. The logic has to be supported all the time. We have to be connected with our customers, even if we're building major industrial controls that once upon a time we would have no connection with. And even if we don't have a connection with it, our customers are looking for help and support when suddenly something becomes vulnerable. So instead of thinking about things as the secure design life cycle of one release, uh, shift everywhere idea is more along the lines of product support throughout the product life cycle. How long will that product live out there in the in the in the world for your users? And what do you do to support that? So we have to continually look at things, continually improve. Um, so if th everything's evolving. Shift left to me is kind of an older concept where we're kind of moving more towards shift everywhere. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think it does. It's interesting. So this concept of shift everywhere, how do you sell that to a product team who may think uh, that just doing security testing and many different kinds of security testing is sufficient because that's what they've heard and that's what they just intuitively understand, find vulnerabilities, that's what security does. Yeah, um, sell uh, is an interesting word here. Um, when the culture has been historically right oriented or test focused. Um, what's required um, isn't necessarily a sales pitch, but maybe a culture change because uh, this has been the way of doing things uh, in the product development industry for many, many years, uh, far before my time. Uh, it's, it's the way things were done. It was kind of the QA way of doing things. A lot of companies still do it that way. And so when you start to introduce something that is a seismic shift to the common culture that has been established for decades in some places, right? Uh, it's, it's more than a sales pitch. Uh, it, it is a culture change. So how does one go about instituting culture change? Uh, well, I mean, it really depends on a lot of factors. And I, I like to look at it more as culture evolution because even when we get to our preferred new way of doing things, um, we can never be complacent. And so what we do and how we get there is we have to start to demonstrate value with actions and returns on those actions and investments. Uh, and how do we do that? We pilot our ideas. Even if we know the ideas absolutely are going to work or we're 80% sure that it's going to be a much better way of doing things than the old way, so to speak, no matter where we're at on that spectrum of improvement uh, and continual improvement, we pilot. Even if we're 100% sure, we pilot and we prove that, that this new methodology is gonna return value. And then we begin to shift into the new culture, uh, the new way of doing things. And that's what starts to evoke the culture change and helps us evolve pilot, prove, shift, evolve. These are kind of the tenant steps to the culture change that, that is, is constant. And for me, as I said, it's become more of culture evolution. Uh, more than once in my career, I've had an executive or a high level engineering leader come to me and say, we've done a tremendous amount of this cybersecurity stuff. When are we going to be done? The answer is never, because as soon as we think we've got all the answers, we learn that things have changed and we have to shift to support that. So the bottom line is we show our teams, we show our colleagues an easier way to the finish line, right? A way that reduces overhead and also achieves better results. And, and hopefully it's not too complicated of a path. Sometimes we could get there in steps and stages. In fields like mine, data and results drive cultural evolution. And what we try to focus on is providing results and value. If we can boil the ocean of cyber focus requirements in the process, then that's great. We're evolving. But sometimes we have to take things in pieces, start to move the needle, um, and then 
that's what changes the culture. Does that, does that all make sense to you? Yeah. I mean, it's uh, certainly something others have spoken about the really the perspective is about change management. So it's not so much selling people. It's a, uh, it's the idea that we have to evolve, like you said, in culture and, and some of the things you talked about are just basic tenets of change management, uh, which yeah, you have to demonstrate really value before yeah. you start to move something, especially things that are institutional. Okay. This has been working this way for 20 years and we haven't encountered that type of problem. Well, that doesn't mean you're not going to. And all you have to do is open the newspaper to see lots of other industries that never encountered that type of problem either until today. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's interesting. And the one thing, you know, that comes to mind for me is that, um, it's just yet another skill set that you need out of the product security function um, that maybe not everybody has. So it's certainly, I think, one of the things that distinguishes the leaders in, in the space, chief product security officers, who have to understand not just the software development and cybersecurity and uh, all kinds of other domains, but, but also understand this piece on change management. Because if you can't do that successfully, it's hard to do anything else. Yeah, that's right. I mean, even if we uh, are certain that we know the answers, um, sometimes uh, diplomacy is required. Sometimes you you have there are a lot of stakeholders in product security. Well, I, I, often I, I get the question of, hey, who who are the product security stakeholders? And it's anyone that's impacted by the manufacturer use of our products. All so virtually everybody inside the company, you know, and virtually all of our users. Um, so, the, I mean, the stakeholders and other disciplines are kind of a little more narrowly defined, but for us inside of the company, we have to work really well, not usually, of course, engineering is where our primary focus is because we're in the software layer, building the widget with them, making sure it's done securely. And then, and then of course, we tend to work a lot with QA folks because we do a lot of our own testing. So we like to do things in parallel. We like to do our own version of regression testing, of course. But the, the thing that tends to get lost is that we also work with our channel, uh, the sales folks, marketing, those type of people, because uh, in communications people, business leaders, because sometimes you need an infusion of investment to get something done. Uh, also, the, the boots on the ground that are connected to the end user, the, the sales organization, they tend to know what customers are asking about and what customers are concerned about. And also they're usually best positioned to find out when we're not connected into the system, which is pretty common in BMS manufacturing space. So we still sell a lot of hardware that is not connected to us, but it's connected into a customer building environment. Um, they're best positioned to understand what's going right, what's going wrong, uh, what their cybersecurity concerns are. Many of our customers are big commercial entities and they have their own security professionals. So being connected into all aspects of your own business as well as that of your end users is critical. So it goes beyond just the technical skills to be a security professional. You know, CPSO and his or her organization must be able to field the type of personnel that is not only good at being responsive and proactive and also being reactive, uh, but we also must be good listeners to the, to the market, to the vertical, to the channel, to the end users, to the internal stakeholders as well. Yeah, makes sense. That's a, it's a good perspective, John. Um, so it's all been quite insightful. As we wrap up uh, my questions here, just one last thing. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with the listeners? Yeah, I mean, the, the, for me, the key is that complacency in cyber is poison. You know, resting on the laurels of our previous work, previous analysis and, and assessments, it's dangerous for a security professional. You know, we could do everything perfectly for a particular product or release today, and it could still fail. It may get hacked later, especially if we push that product, let's say we did everything right on widget release 1.0. We, we did all the proactive things. We developed all the right cybersecurity requirements. We built in an array of controls. 
We tested it ad nauseum. It goes out the door in perfect state. Perfect today. Perfect today is not perfect tomorrow. Uh, attacks change, attack vectors change, and attackers learn how to do things differently. So that's why I, I tell my team all the time, we can be perfect today and still fail tomorrow and complacency will kill us. Attacks happen all the time because vectors shift. And sometimes there are manufacturers out there that will look at it as the responsibility is to develop the product securely on this release, push it out the door. And after that, our job's done, we're on to the next product, right? The controls and defenses of today can and likely will become vulnerable tomorrow. So it is incumbent upon us that shifting left is not enough. Continued vigilance, analysis, and continual improvements required. And the tools and capabilities that enable that mission requirement are critical to not only our mission success at Carrier, but also, more importantly, that of our customers and end users. So I mean, that's my biggest lesson that I, I like to leave with my team. And uh, hopefully that resonates with you as well. Absolutely. Uh, I think that's very insightful. And I think that it'll resonate with uh, our listeners too. So I really appreciate it. Thanks for your time today, John. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.